Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully you all caught the, um, the great keynote fireside chat and, and presentations this morning. I am Christine Bevilacqua, and I will be your host um, for as much of the API security track as you are joining us for it this morning. Um, this morning, we're focused on API security fundamentals, and I'm joined in this first session by Colin Dominey, who's the CTO at 42 Crunch. And he's going to speak to us about OWASP API Security's Top 10, the brand new release that came out in 2023, just earlier this month. Welcome, Colin. Hi, Christine, and uh, welcome. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody joining. Good to be here. Excited for this session. So let's get Yeah, that. sure. Let us know yeah. what, so what's what's new, what's changed, what's different in, in OWASP's updated API top 10? Yeah, so when I came up with the talk title, I think something old, something new. I think we've got many of the the favorites and they normally, they're still at the top of the charts as it were, as if I were a radio DJ, um, but we've got some new entries. So it's, it's, it's quite exciting to see what's changed. Um, exciting. So looking forward and to getting into it. And really quickly, anyone who's got questions, please put those in the comments um, and Colin and I will have time for questions at the, at the end of the session. Take it away, Colin. Sure, thank you very much. So as Christine said, I'm the um, Chief Technology Evangelist at uh, 42 Crunch. Um, my job is to evangelize and talk about uh, API security. Um, so my own research into the OWASP API um, security top 10. So some of you may be familiar with my name. Um, if you subscribe to the apisecurity.io newsletter, um, this is one of the, it's a vendor neutral uh, news resource. If you're not uh, familiar with this, this is, I hope, um, a pretty popular um, newsletter that we run um, over here. And we talk about all things API security. And, you know, I, I've taken a lot of the data. It's been very interesting for me to have a look at the changes in the OWASP API security top 10 in 2023 and contrast that back to the 2019 version, which is the original version. And, and then also compare that just somewhat anecdotally to the, the, the data that we're seeing, that I'm seeing on a weekly basis um, with API flaws and breaches. So if we look back on at the headlines from the API security.io newsletter over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, we, we, we see a breach or two almost every week. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is, as I take you through some of the new categories, I'm going to give you some of the backstory on why I think these are on our more relevant to us and why these have made it into the 2023 version. So just as possibly everybody knows the OWASP top 10 and, and how they do their methodology and how they do your scoring, which is a very quick intro on the way that they rank. There is a, a science, there's, there's some science behind this as to how they rank at the number one through number 10. So what they do is for each category, they look at a number of, of scoring factors across the top of that chart. So they'll look at things like the exploitability. So how, how easy is a particular vulnerability to attack? Um, how prevalent is the weakness? So do we see this a lot? And this is where I'll give some insights from what we see on real world data. How easy is it to detect that vulnerability? What is the technical impact and the business impact? And then they, they, they rate those on a um, score from one to three, and then they rank those up. Uh, and that's how they, they rank the top 10. And then also um, this, this discussion, the way that the OWASP Foundation runs this, it's all done very publicly. There's a GitHub repo. If you go and Google GitHub API security, um, you'll go and find the repo. And a lot of this discussion is done via pull requests. So you can go and see, and it's, it's quite instructive to go and have a look at some of the thinking behind coming up with this, um, with this top 10. So we're staying on this slide for quite a while. This is um, this is the 2019 version and the 2023 version. And what I'm going to do is is hopefully hopefully visually uh, kind of show you what um, what those changes are looking like. So uh, if we look at the two items that have dropped off the 2019 version, so we've lost API number eight and API number ten. So API eight is injection um, vulnerabilities, and the um, API ten is uh, is um, insufficient logging and monitoring. We look at these two in a moment. Now, the ones that have stayed the same, so there's a lot that stay the same, as I said, something old, something new. Um, there's lots of old, there's lots of things that we know about. So BOLA, broken object level authorization, this is otherwise known as indirect object reference. Uh, that's still top. Uh, it's still the most, pre it's one of the most prevalent and it's definitely one of the most impactful. And it's also one that attackers know how to exploit. So it scores very highly on that, on that uh, scale of three grid. 
uh, and that's why Bola is still number one. I would still say I would say Bola is still probably the most significant API threat uh, that we face, um, just down to the the impact. Broken user authentication is now um, still features. It's been renamed to broken authentication because now obviously authentication flaws apply not only to users but also to machine to machine communication. Um, this holds steady at number two. Um, my empirical data, my my instinct, my gut feel, nearly every vulnerability that I, I cover and I and I write up and I review, normally involves some form of broken authentication uh, somewhere in the in 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 the in the exploit in the kill chain. Um, I'm actually writing a book on defending APIs at the moment, and I wrote the chapter on uh, common vulnerabilities and and attacks. Um, half the half that chapter was on broken authentication. It's by far the most uh, the, the most number of ways that API developers can get things wrong. There's a multitude of ways that authentication can become broken. Um, personally, I probably have that as the most significant uh, vector. That would be my API number one. Um, but yeah, it's number two, so very significant. The third category, um, what the OWASP Foundation have done here is they've taken the two data categories, which were API three, which was excessive data exposure, and API 6, which is mass assignment. Now think of these as uh, the first one is the is the read, uh, the second one is the is the write operation. So excessive data exposure, your API leaks too much data. The other one is um, you are um, accepting input data that you shouldn't. And what they've done is they've rolled that up into a single category and given it a, a, a shiny new name. It's called broken object property level authorization. So when you see API 3, think of that as anything relating to data. Lack of resources and rate limiting, and they've given that a more generic and broader encapsulation in its name, unrestricted resource consumption, that stays as API number 4, uh, also an incredibly common uh, vulnerability. We see this a lot. It's also one of the easier ones to protect against. Okay, so that's why it's, it's sort of downranked slightly. A broken function level authorization. This is the corollary of the of Bola. So where Bola is about broken access to a function, uh, to an object. In other words, to, to a data object. Um, BFLA broken function level authorization is uh, a client that can access an API endpoint and do an operation that it shouldn't be allowed. So this is like being able to delete data uh, which it shouldn't have access to, um, or being able to execute admin functions. Security misconfiguration, this is a pretty broad catch-all um, that covers um, any number of, of ways that you can misconfigure your API. Um, that it, it drops down one at number eight. Um, improper assets management becomes improper in inventory management, a slightly broader term. Uh, that stays at nine. And then we've got the new, there's three new ones. So unrestricted access to sensitive business flows. That's a lot of words for what is actually one very short um, three or four letter word, bots. This is all about bot attacks. This is all about um, being able to use your API in a way uh, in which it wasn't attended, uh, intended. Server-side request forgery. So this is uh, new to API top 10, but an old category in software security. This is uh, when a client can trick a server into redirecting uh, to some way that isn't under the server's control. And we do look at these in a little bit more detail. Unsafe consumption of APIs. So APIs are really an enabler to build complex and to assemble complex software systems. And APIs are seldom, APIs are consumed, right? APIs, you provide a, 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 you provide a function via your API. And um, of course, you, you often are consuming upstream APIs. Now, do you trust these APIs? Um, should they be trusted? And this, this really talks to the point of um, that that security of your supply chain. Right, just summarizing. So we got uh, two dropping out, uh, uh, six or seven staying the same, and then we got three brand new ones. So the ones that have dropped out now, um, I won't go into this in detail. I think everybody should know what injection attacks are. The issue with injection attacks is, you know, they affect all software systems, not only um, APIs. Uh, this doesn't mean that we should think that we solved the problem of injection. You know, and, uh, injection is still very prevalent. As recently as September of last year, um, I discovered a, an inject. There was a um, research done or, or write up on uh, um, an inject command injection vulnerability in Bitbucket. Right, so these haven't gone away. So don't um, you know? Don't think that in injection attacks are uh, no longer prevalent. They're definitely still there, and people know how to attack these. 
Insufficient logging and monitoring. I mean, the reason this dropped out again is this is not specific to APIs. All software systems are affected in some way by logging and, mon and monitoring concerns. You know, people either, they do um, monitoring in two ways. They either do logging in two ways, too little or too much, right? They either leak too much information or they don't capture enough information. So, um, but it's not API specific. So that's why it's dropped out. Right, let's get into the new topics. So I described this as unrestricted um, access to sensitive business flows. And really, if you read that long verbiage and that description, um, this really is is, bo is bots, the, the rising concern of, of bots or uh, automated attacks against APIs. I think develop, um, attackers are getting wise to the fact that uh, a, a lot of business logic is being exposed by APIs. So even something that might have a web front end, let's just take an example of an airline. I'm going to talk through the example of an airline uh, booking system. You know, it might have a web a web front end, but most, most attackers will be able to understand the API logic that's sitting behind that and then to abuse that logic. And let's take a, a scenario to talk you, you through how this looks in real life. Um, attack, an attacker might go and um, you know, a new flight becomes available, uh, new dates are released for, for holiday flights, and an attacker might go and book every single seat on that flight, right, without, uh, with a refundable uh, booking, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not committing to paying for them. So he block books the entire flight, then they wait till right before the flight. Of course, the airline now um, might then, then what he does is he releases all those bookings. So suddenly the, the airline is scheduled to fly, um, but it has no bookings, so they discount the prices, and he goes in and he buys a cheap seat, right? So there's there's no real vulnerability in that API, right? He, it's not like he's found a bowler issue. Uh, what they're doing is they're simply using the logic, the business logic of the API um, in an unusual way, and they're doing this by doing this at scale and at volume, right? And they're doing it through automation. Uh, another good example is um, in the United Kingdom, we have a couple of property websites where they're tracking property prices and the market. And a lot of people, I'm, I'm aware of people that are going and accessing these APIs and then using them to be able to get sort of real, almost real time uh, house price uh, information, which is obviously if you're in the market for, for buying houses, that's really, really valuable information. So while this is an API vulnerability, it's not necessarily a flaw. There's no, no, there's not necessarily a design vulnerability in the API itself, right? And this means that this is a, a category that is incredibly hard to protect against, to protect against in um, a reliable way, because you 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 run that risk of uh, if you become too uh, if you become too trigger happy on protecting against this, you actually break the normal flow, so you're going to impact your end users. Right, so this is a hard one uh, to solve this um, in, in a good way. So this is straight out of the OWASP uh, website. I'm not taking any credit for this. This is what they recommend. Um, you know, basically, you need to solve this problem both at an in business and an engineering level. Um, look at the engineering ones. So the usual protections are device fingerprinting, trying to put some human interaction in there. So trying to force it into an asynchronous manner and off out of bound um, access like needing a capture um, or um, step up off um, to be able to check that there's still a human operating that. Uh, and then look for things that couldn't um, be, uh, aren't realistic of human behavior. So, you know, extremely quick accesses between adding to cart and completing purchases. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is the one that for me, you know, I'm not surprised to see this coming in. API six. This is probably one of the most, the most dangerous of the, of the new, of all vulnerabilities, um, because from a technical point of view, this is actually a really, really hard one um, to protect against. Server side request forgery. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on this. Um, folk may be familiar with this from um, AppSec days if you've got an AppSec background. And really, this is about um, a client. This is, this, this is a corollary to client-side request forgery. If we're familiar with the old days, um, we used to have websites that used to trick us into clicking things while we were logged into Facebook, and then we would cross-post um, onto our Facebook page from a from a, um, a you know from a dangerous website. Um, so that's tricking your client into doing something that it shouldn't. This is the opposite. This is when a a client of the API can can trick the server into redirecting somewhere that it shouldn't. 
And this really has arisen out of uh, the advances of microservices and distributed architectures, where a lot of times um, APIs are being redirected internally to other services. And that redirection is being is 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 happening via um, internal URIs that are being passed as request parameters. Right. And attackers are discovering that they can actually subvert um, these URIs and then <clears throat> trick the the server into redirecting to something that is now under their under the attacker's control. Right. So, uh, and this is pretty severe. Right. If you if you can make the server go somewhere else, you can obviously steal data. Um, you can launch attacks against the, the server. You can do things like local file includes, where you can go and access um, password files on that server or other sensitive data. So uh, a pretty serious issue. The good news is we in the AppSec world have known about this, this category of flaw for oh, decades now. Um, and there's a couple of very, very strong patterns that can be used to protect this, right? The, the, the number one way that you would do that is you use an allow list. So you don't allow... Um, you don't allow a wildcard list of redirects. So you restrict um, the range of paths that can be redirected to. And that's the easiest way to do that. And then there's some you know, sanity things there, like disable HTTP insecure redirections, validate data. Um, what else have we got? You know, um, Blocking your certain media types, um, lock down your origins where you can accept information from. Don't. Um, don't trust any user, don't trust that user input. So not one that I think I'm particularly concerned about because the, the patterns are well understood um, for how to defend against this category of attack. Um, so the third and final one, API 10. So this is one category where I, I think at, a, at an intellectual level, absolutely get this one, the fact that we now assembling software systems, we don't build them anymore. We connect APIs together. And if we blindly trust upstream APIs, you know, we're exposing ourselves to risk. You know, if we if we connecting to a, a service, we get an API key and we start consuming from an upstream API. You know, how, how do we know that that API is not in itself accidentally injecting malicious payloads? You know, particularly if it's passing complex data objects, are we not opening ourselves up to um, potential injection attacks, XML entity attacks, um, injection attacks via uh, malicious data in the in the payloads of the bodies? You know, how are we how are we governing and ensuring that that data is in fact um, something that we should accept? Um, the ways to prevent this, there's no super clean way to do this. A lot of this comes down to a governance and 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 uh, vendor management problem. So if you're consuming upstream APIs, just be cognizant of the provenance of those APIs, right? Are those organizations, have you, you know, is your trust uh, that you're placing them and is that is that warranted? You know, do they know, um, do you know how they assembling and building their APIs? And then obviously some of the housekeeping that you can do obviously in, um, um, secure channels, uh, use you know, use enhanced um, communication uh, authentication, so mutual TLS. Make sure that your trusted connection is indeed trusted, right? So, and then again, don't follow blindly, follow redirects. Okay, and then just to just to recap and getting to the end of the chat. So, if you do have questions, we're gonna we're gonna move to questions in a moment. A um, couple of the, the name changes and terminology changes that we've seen, I think broken user authentication, changing to broken authentication, I think that just reflects the changing nature of APIs. They're no longer, um, they're no longer, no longer solely the domain of um, users. Um, obviously, we've got machine connections. Um, the lack of resource and rate limiting to unrestricted resource consumption. This is a little bit of a, a nod to um, the pop growing popularity of GraphQL. Uh, I think GraphQL is one of those technologies where it's particularly, you know, um, prone to being resource constrained. And the fact that, uh, you know, attackers, uh, we, there are a number of well-known attacks, well-publicized attacks that can be launched against GraphQL backends. Um, to launch uh, denial of service attacks simply by exhausting server resources. Um, so that that really captures that. The fact that we we generally talk about um, inventory management around APIs, and then the fact that we've wrapped up our two um, data categories. A lot of resources for learning more. I mean, the OWASP would be my number one recommendation. Dana Epp, 
uh, has published quite a bit. He's he's got a great article on exploiting SRF. If people aren't following and Dana's talking of this event, so strong recommendation to go and um, grab his talk. Uh, I can't remember the topic, but he talks a lot about the OWASP top ten. Um, so go and get get hold of that. Uh, Port Swigger, the folk that make uh, the Burp Suite tool, uh, they've got great AppSec Basics labs that you can do. Uh, and 42 Crunch, we did a recent webinar with uh, Jim Manico, uh, Mr. AppSec, and he talked a lot about both SRF, uh, SSRF and client-side request forgery. Right, so that's your what's, that's your, what's new, what's old, um, OWASP Top 10 2023. Um, and I think my takeaway comments, I think it maps nicely to to what I'm seeing. Gut feel says that it's quite reflective of of what's happening in the um in the industry and what we're seeing in the real world. The one I'm worried about there, um, the one we need to pay most attention to is there is the category of bot attacks. So thank you very much. I uh, hope that was useful. Look, looking forward to taking some questions. Thanks, Colin. So so I have one question for you. Um, sure. You mentioned at the very top of the of the session that you're writing a book and that there's a significant focus in that book around broken authentication. Yeah. And that in that. your perspective, that might be the biggest threat vector. Do you know? Um, it, it might have been in those resources that you just shared, but are there is there are there specific resources or guidance that will help developers um, around best practices or even architects, right, on authorization? And then I guess. Similarly, are there are there guidance or resources, tools for um, DevSec or security teams around how to test for um, or monitor for authorization? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. That so the aren't at the well. I say they aren't. So the authentication issue. Um, generally, we are looking at using standard patterns. I think the, mm -hmm. the authentication one is an easier one to solve because using things like OAuth2 and using some of their recommended flows yeah. is the right way to go. And where I see people getting into trouble is when they start trying to cook their own mechanisms of distributing tokens and auth, um, authorization tokens. Mm -hmm. So the, the number one thing that people can do to help themselves is use standard patterns, use, use things like OAuth2 and don't go and try and do um you know unusual or, or odd uh, patterns or anti-patterns sure so that's what i'd recommend uh authorization is a much trickier one mm -hmm. uh, because it depends a little bit more on the on the domain so it depends on on the frameworks that you're using there's a lot of standard libraries that are coming out now that really help software developers to do their authorization at function and object level in a much more uniform way and again rather than having a, um, a complex sort of handwritten hard and a very fragile framework that they develop themselves, use one of the standard libraries that are available. But no, I don't know at the moment, I think API security, which I maintain, that is something we're looking at enhancing with, you know, exactly that. Like, I'm just getting started. What do I do? What's step one, two, three? What does that look like? But unfortunately, at this stage, being, you know, we being somewhat nascent in the, this industry, we we could do a better job of that. And I'm, you know, firmly putting my hand up to to help get cracking and solving that problem. Yeah, it's not an easy problem to solve, right? I think especially with some of the legacy APIs that are out there, to your point, that exactly. aren't really maybe taking advantage of OAuth, um, you know, OAuth 2, or, or, you know, have, have built their own authentication yes. and authorization mechanisms over time. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to, to quick pick your brain. I know that, um, the OWASP, I think their application security verification standards on like some variation of version four, but I noticed that version five is soon to be released. Um, I did a quick search of that and looked kind of for API specific guidance. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there are some placeholders in there for like API architecture and things like that. Do you see um, in working with, with OWASP, is there any, will there be a separate version of security verification standards for APIs specifically, or will that be baked yeah. into kind so of that's the application? A, yeah, that's a good question. And it, it sort of, let me, I'll answer this question in a, in a, in a, in a quickly in, a, in another way. So people often say, why do we have an OWASP? Uh, why do we have an API top 10 at all? Mm -hmm. Why is it not just the, so I, I, th I think from the categories of flaws, I think that's now distinct enough. I think the top 10 and the, in the API is, is quite distinct to the, the main web app top 10. Now, as far as ASVS goes, I'm a huge fan of ASVS. I 
haven't looked recently at what they're doing, uh, I would think they would just incorporate some some API um, c controls into that. That would be my recommendation. I don't think it would warrant um, entirely splitting that. Yeah. But uh, I'm speaking without having had a look. I've, I used I, so how long ago I've used ASVS was about when it was version three still. So, <laughs> but I'm a huge fan. It's one of my, you know, quick wins for for API and uh, um, AppSec uh, practitioners is is just go and latch onto the ASVS. It's your friend. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Colin. That was a really yeah. that was a, that was a great. I I love the brevity of it, but I also really appreciated all of the specificity around guidance. Um, and yep. what we can do as security professionals. So I appreciate cool. it. And and I know that the talks will be available um, post event. So thank you very much and have a great day. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Colin.